There are some that are more specifically recognized for, for helping to uh, control blood sugar levels. Uh, Banaba is one, uh, Gymnema is one, one that's easily recognized is cinnamon. One of the widest uh, selling anti-diabetic drugs, glucophage, uh, metformin is the, is the generic name, actually came from an herb called goat's root. Goat's root by itself has some toxins in it, so you, it's not an herb that you would want to take regularly but they pulled this non-toxic chemical out and that became metformin. That drug is actually a step up from the herb. Most of the time, it's the other way around. Hey everyone, today we have Dr. Bill Rawls, who's been practicing medicine for over 30 years and the author of a new book, which I loved, titled The Cellular Wellness Solution. Tap into your full health potential with the science-based power of herbs. So today we're gonna go all in on herbs. Welcome, Bill. Hey, thanks, Jason. Pleasure to be here, for sure. So let's start with your personal health journey. In the book, you talk about this powerful moment. It's, it's beautiful. You're on the beach in North Carolina at age 47, but then something goes wrong. So let's start there. What happened and how has that experience shaped you? Yeah, you know, it's the it's a story of this conventional physician who's now promoting herbs, which is kind of weird, right? And and we have these life things, changing things that happen, and they push us in a journey that we don't expect. So you know, 30 some years ago, I went to medical school and came out and went into obstetrics and gynecology because I really enjoyed the wellness aspect. You know, it was dealing mainly with healthy people, bringing life into the world. But the deal was I practiced in a small town where you had to take call every second to third night. And I was on one of those people as if I had somebody in labor or somebody was in the hospital, I just didn't sleep. So 15, 20 years, I rarely slept for every second to third night. And I just pushed through it. You know, I thought, hey, I'm tough. I can do this. And in the late 40s, it caught up with me and I eventually crashed um, and, you know, found that the medical system really didn't have much to help me. And you know, it definitely was precipitated by stress, but there was more to it. And I just, um, I wasn't getting better despite I stopped taking call. You know, I took a break from the practice and I was having every symptom known and nobody was helping me. They could help, uh, they could throw drugs at my symptoms and that was about it. First, I identified with fibromyalgia. Later, like a lot of people with fibromyalgia, found that I was carrying some of the microbes associated with a Lyme disease, identified with that, tried antibiotics, they didn't help, found that chronic Lyme disease wasn't even a diagnosis that was recognized by the medical establishment. Um, and then I started looking for alternatives and did try lots of stuff. Finally happened upon a book that was suggesting a protocol using high doses of uh, some pretty potent extracts of various different herbs and I got my life back and it was awesome. But it wasn't just that I overcame these symptoms of Lyme disease. And this was like a five-year course with all of this. Everything got better, you know? Um, I had hypertension when I was younger. My blood pressure normalized, my cholesterol normalized. A part of that was I changed my lifestyle, I ate better, I was, you know, my health habits remarkably improved. And, you know, I, I learned how to sleep again. But, um, but the herbs did things that were remarkable. And I have spent the past decade and a half of my life trying to really figure out why. And so you had a lot going on. And, and I don't want to spend too much time on Lyme because Lyme could be a 12-hour podcast. <laughs> um, but 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 it, but it is, and but you wrote a book on Lyme. It's a big part of your story, and I'd be remiss not to ask this because it's just I just found this out this weekend. I'm curious your take. 
Someone I respect pointed to a, a, a conspiracy theory, and I'm not one, I'm not a conspiracy, I think our audience knows this, I'm not one prone to conspiracy theories, but, but I, I did say, okay, this is interesting, that Lyme originated in Plum Island, off the coast of Long Island in Lyme, Connecticut, due to like essentially a bad biological experiment and then spread. So essentially man-made and, and, and there's actually like, I Googled it. I saw, 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 and okay, some people have written about this. Is it just complete, you know, nonsense? What's your take? All right. Well, well, yeah, I'll, I'll do the Plum Island story very briefly. And it is one that circulates and recirculates out there pretty frequently. Um, there is a little bit of validity to it, but I don't think that that time they had any capacity to actually manipulate the bacteria to make it more virulent or have a higher potential to cause disease. Uh, this bacteria has been with us for most of human history, and it's not actually a very uh, virulent bacteria. Now I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but what I think they what did happen in Prom Island is the military was honestly looking at collecting a whole bunch of ticks and infecting them with Borrelia, not necessarily a modified version of Borrelia, and figuring out if they could dump that on the enemy somewhere to debilitate the enemy. <laughs> and it never went anywhere. And I think that was probably about the extent of it. So I don't think what we're currently seeing from Lyme disease is a... a it, you know, I, I don't think it came out of Plum Island. I think there were some weird things going on and, you know, they've done some weird stuff, but I don't think they actually manipulated the bacteria. Um, the biggest evidence I would say for that is people don't typically die of Lyme disease. It's not a, a, a severely virulent bacteria and a lot of people harbor it without getting sick. I think I picked it up in my childhood and it wasn't until additive stress of 15 years of not sleeping and poor health habits at the same time that I got sick. So if they had increased the virulence of the bacteria, they probably it would probably kill more people. And people don't typically die of acute Lyme disease. Now, people do die of the chronic manifestations, and I think they're links to dementia and heart disease and a whole lot of other things not just Borrelia, but a lot of other microbes. But, um, but it doesn't kill people acutely. In fact, the vast majority of people who get it don't even become ill acutely, and that's the problem. 95% of the people I talk to with chronic Lyme disease don't remember a tick bite and did not become sick acutely. So that suggests that the, the bacteria virulence hasn't increased but what has changed over the past 50 to 100 years is all the stress factors that we're under, high toxins, high stress level, bad food. All of these things are hitting us like never before. We are just bombarded with unnatural toxins in our world, and it's all putting us up for a higher risk of disease. So that's why we're seeing so much long COVID. That's why six out of 10 Americans are suffering from a chronic illness. So what Lyme disease did for me is really studying this microbe factor and all the other things is it opened up a window for understanding all of chronic illness in a very different way and how to avoid it. So let's go there. So I'm glad you've, you've somewhat debunked the Plum Island conspiracy theory. I still think it's interesting. To me, the larger lesson is you just shouldn't mess with mother nature and our ecosystems because there are often un unintended consequences for just not they just don't don't mess with mother nature you you can apply that to anything you know wh whether whatever happened to in the Lu what lab in wuhan china whether covid came out of that or didn't or had any influence you know do we need to really be doing that so, yeah i don't disagree exactly so let's se let's segue to herbs because as you so eloquently pointed out, there are so many stressors in the world we live in. And you, in the book, you know, specifically you mentioned poor diet, toxic environment, mental stress, physical stress, 
microbial stress. And so I'm, I'm sure our audience like myself is nodding. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. And so with that said, herbs, you know, there's so many tools in our toolkit we have, you know, e e eating better, uh, removing chemicals from our homes, moving, you know, finding some sort of stress management, uh, tool that works for us. All these things we, we kind of know, microbial stress you, you mentioned too. And oftentimes there's so many things at our disposal. And I think we all know herbs, but I don't necessarily think herbs come top of mind when you say, you know what, I'm going to be in the best shape of my life or I got this thing going on. I got to make sure I've got a, a, a solid herb routine. So let's go to herbs. Why herbs for you? You're, you're an MD. You're, you're, you know, <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, it's because herbs work differently than drugs, and, and we'll go over that. And I'd like to maybe give a little bit of background of how I think about herbs, and I think that's really important for understanding herbs in a way that we can apply them to protect wellness. And and that is, you know, the, the, the issue... A lot of people think of herbs as kind of weak versions of drugs. And what I would say is they're completely different. It's like apples and oranges. And we can use, get, gain the benefits of both. So, you know, we do a really good job in, in healthcare system with acute intervention with drugs. But we don't do a very good job with chronic illness because we are not affecting healing processes. So that's, that's a conclusion, you know, taking that ill spectrum of illness and wellness down to the cellular level really helps understand what's going on and why I understand herbs very differently than maybe a traditional herbal herbalist. Um, so when you look at illness or symptoms, what we're talking about is cells that have been stressed in the body. We're all made of cells. Everything that happens in the body is a function of cells, whether that's your heart beating or walking across the room or thyroid hormone being produced, it's all being done by cells. Symptoms happen when cells become stressed or injured. Healing is, when, is the ability of our cells to recover from stress. And this is really remarkable. So when you look at uh, our cells, man, there's nothing man-made that comes close. Every one of our cells has the ability to repair internal damage or regenerate new cells. That's what healing is. So we recover from symptoms because our cells recover. Chronic illness and chronic symptoms occur when stresses are ongoing and we just, our cells don't have that opportunity to recover. So these stress factors that we talk about, poor nutrition, not eating what our cells need to function, uh, toxic substances that get, that compromise cellular functions, chronic mental stress disrupts uh, communication. Cells have to talk to one another to function together and you have to have uh, a good sleep for cells to recover. Cells need downtime. Physical factors, being sedentary. We're not getting blood flow to wash the toxins away from our cells. And then the microbes, man, is that a big factor that affects everything. So all of these factors are, are affecting us. So basically, our cells are under assault all the time. So... When we do things like eat better, a high vegetable diet that's low in processed carbohydrates and has good sources of protein, but not excessive protein. Um, we detoxify our world. We get good sleep and keep our stress level down. We exercise regularly that just washes the toxic substances away from our cells. And be smart about microbes, but also just be smart about keeping our cells healthy those things are all great, but you can accentuate, you can enhance every single one of those things by taking herbs. And that is the most remarkable property of the herbs. So when we're talking about herbs, we're talking about plants, right? Plants all are multicellular organisms, just like we are. And plants have to protect their cells. So 
plants are, are the best chemists on earth. They use chemistry to solve problems. So plants produce these chemicals that we call phytochemicals, plant chemicals, that neutralize toxins, counteract free radicals, uh, help us detoxify the body or detoxify cells, counteract all the stress factors, including all the microbes. So all plants have antimicrobial properties. Now, things that we define as herbs have a biochemical makeup that matches ours. So it's like poison ivy. Man, it has a lot of great protective chemicals, but it also has chemicals in there that just don't work with our biochemistry. It's poisonous. So we would never take poison ivy as an herb. But um, interestingly, most of the plants out there benefit us. So when we take an herb, we gain all of those benefits. Our cells gain protection against all of these stress factors. So whatever efforts you're making, the herbs are going to accentuate that. You know, when I was researching the book, I found a study that defined hundreds of herbs have, have anti-diabetic properties. They protect our cells from car excess carbohydrates, um, and they normalize insulin and other hormone pathways. So you have that. Um, all of our herbs have, have uh, antioxidants that protect air against free radicals. Um, they help neutralize toxins and protect the liver. So all of these herbs are doing these wonderful things to protect our cells, which enhances healing. And that's something drugs can't do. So what the drugs are doing is counteracting all the cellular stress factors, promoting healing, which takes us to a better place. And the big thing that all herbs have, now some herbs are, have stronger properties than others, but all herbs have a broad range of antimicrobial properties. Now, it's not just like a chemical that kills bacteria like an antibiotic. Here you're talking about a spectrum of hundreds of different chemicals that have a wide range of activity against viruses, protozoa, yeast. But interestingly, when you, don't take, when you take an herb, and this is very different than an antibiotic, and this is something that I just observed over time. When you take an herb with antimicrobial properties, and this is true of any herb, it doesn't disrupt the gut flora. You know, that plant has to define friend versus foe. So these plant phytochemicals are selective for potential, potential pathogens, but they don't kill our normal flora. So when you're taking herbs, it actually helps balance the gut microbiome. In fact, I found that herbs, many herbs, work better than probiotics for balancing the gut. I've been taking herbs continually for 15 years. My gut was a wreck for years. It's great. My microbiome is nice and I don't take a probiotic. So all of those things together, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a lot to unpack there. And, you know, you mentioned antibiotics, pharmaceuticals, you think about it, come from herbs, come from plants. You know, that, that's, I, I, I've read some pieces where the environmental conversation what we're doing in terms of deforestation, you know, that there's a race to find, you know, as we think about threats to civilization, you know, one, you think of microbes and what's happening and becoming antibiotic resistant. And then two, the, the race for the cure for something we're not faced with, you're going to find in the forest, so to speak. And we're eliminating, you, you talk about phytochemicals and what's happened to them over the years. We're thinking about herbs and plants and how, you know, we need abundance. If we actually are going to use herbs in their more natural form or in a pharmaceutical form, if, if it's life-threatening, it comes from plants. And what we're doing environmentally, we're, we're kind of <laughs> limiting what's available in the future. And that's worrisome as we think about viruses and microbes and becoming antibiotic resistant. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, 
It, it is interesting. Yes, and it's true. I, I found a source that I used in the book that suggested that uh, 70% of our pharmaceuticals came from uh, plant sources at one time. And all of our antibiotics came from some natural source. They either came from a yeast, a plant, or a bacteria, every single one of them. But interesting observation. I think a lot of people have, when you hear that, people think, oh, well, we've pulled our drugs from these things we've used as medicinal herbs through history. Yeah, not really. No, it's not true. Um, what we're looking for in plants for drugs is very, very different than what we're, what we're looking for when we look at our healing herbs. So a lot of plants have poisons. Like I said, poison ivy um, has things that are toxic to us. And over time, poison ivy has been evaluated for potential drug use on a number of different occasions. Uh, they've actually tried to use it for eczema and a variety of things. So what they're looking for in pharmaceuticals is specific chemicals that they can pull from the plant that has a very targeted effect, typically blocking an enzyme, activating some pathway to achieve a specific function. So that's one difference. So our herbs are basically protecting against stress factors that allow our cells to recover from stress. Healing. Healing takes time. It takes a while. We don't want to wait for it. We want that symptom gone now. So what we're doing with a drug is blocking specific pathways that affect cellular behavior in a certain way that blocks a symptom or slows down a disease process. So what we're missing and where, why I think we should bring the other, the, these, these healing herbs in is so important is what we're missing is we're not affecting the stress factors that are propelling the, the symptom or the illness with that particular drug. And therefore, we don't induce healing. People don't get well. They live in a state of managed illness. So it's important. I mean, you know, if you've got a really bad symptom of some kind, addressing that acutely or stabilizing the illness in some way with a drug can be very, very important. But if that's all you're doing, you're never going to make people well. And that's where I think the herbs could be really valuable. Well, thank you for making that point. I think it's an important clarification. We need to address the root cause. Otherwise, you're in this vicious cycle of just managing symptoms and you're never truly getting well. With that said, you know, one of the things I thought was so interesting in your book is you, know, you mentioned being targeted and you mentioned diabetes. I think of huge, huge problem in our country. It's a national security issue. Um, diabetes leads to all sorts of terrible outcomes, to say the least. And you mentioned essentially blood sugar control, very topical right now. I think more and more people are becoming aware, you know, wearing GCMs, Levels does that, which I, I've tested personally and had some interesting insights with regards to which foods spikes my, my blood sugar. I never really thought about herbs playing a role there. So let's, let's spend a moment at these targeted, you know, using herbs in a targeted way. That was one of the ways that stood out to me in the book. So can we spend a moment talking about which or how and which herbs can help us if we're concerned about blood sugar control? Um, yeah, well, for, first off, I would say there are no herbs or no amount of herbs on earth that are going to protect anyone from the level of carbohydrates that most people are consuming today. Um, but we all fight that battle, you know, it's just hard. Um, carbohydrates seep into our food no matter where we go. I don't think the message is have these herbs and then enjoy three donuts, but... <laughs> You know, so we're all we're all trying to cut our carbs, and and we're when we're doing it in different ways with paleo diet and all kinds of different things, um, and it, so so it's a struggle that we all face. Um, but the yeah, the herbs can help us get to that place a little bit better in a variety of ways. So the problem with carbohydrates here, we're talking starches and sugar 
is all of these things break down into simple sugars. Uh, fructose, glucose, table sugar is fructose and glucose. For high fructose corn syrup is fructose and glucose. Starches are change of glucose. All the fructose is converted to glucose um, in your body. And glucose is what we measure to when we talk about someone's blood sugar. Um, we're measuring glucose levels. So when you eat carbs, it's broken down and you get this stream of glucose into your bloodstream. The problem with glucose is that it is a highly reactive molecule. Um, that's desirable. I mean, that's ba basically what's happening. We're going back to plants again. Plants are taking the energy of the sun and storing it in these glucose molecules and we, you know, trade the glucose around. So glucose is basically our inner primary energy uh, currency for life on Earth. Um, but these molecules are very highly reactive. And that's why we keep our blood sugar levels. You have to keep it tightly controlled. A diabetic with high blood sugar levels can die um, because this high energy molecule is toxic to other organic chemicals. And so whether you're talking about collagen or all the working parts of a cell or whatever, what happens is, is glucose sticks to everything. So if you have excessive glucose, um, if you're you know, eating carbohydrates all the time, you have this glucose sticking effect called glycation. And it basically gums up your cells um, it breaks down collagen. I call it a collagen cruncher, which promotes uh, uh, wrinkling of skin. And, you know, it just, and so we have collagen that basically holds us together. It's breaking all of that down in our joints, in our skin, in our heart, brain, everywhere. So it basically just gums everything up and makes a mess of things. In addition, the glucose that isn't, you know, that you don't use. If you're not burning it, you convert it into fat and you have to carry that through your bloodstream and you make that. And so you make particles called lipoproteins to carry it to your fat cells from your liver to your fat cells. And that's where the LDL cholesterol comes in. So we're actually making extra cholesterol to carry all this extra fat that we get from eating the carbohydrates. So the carbohydrates are actually the problem with the cholesterol. Um, so, but all of these things are very toxic to our cells. So the phytochemicals of the herbs actually help protect our tissues. So they, uh, they help neutralize some of the glucose. Um, they also normalize our hormones. So when you're eating too much carbohydrate, um, your, your, the, your regulatory system that uses uh, insulin, your insulin levels go up and your cells become resistant to it. So the herbs are not only protecting our cells directly from the damage in a variety of different ways, they're also helping to normalize some of those hormones that are out of balance. So, and, and you know, so, some of the herbs work as well as some of the drugs like glucophage. Um, to actually uh, bring about um, a little bit better control. Now, you know, you have to do your part. Uh, and you have to you know, continually work to bring those carbohydrates down, but you can get there faster with an herb. And that's just one place that the herbs can really make a difference in our health. And what are some of those herbs? If, if, if we want to be mindful of blood sugar, you know, we're, we're not you know, stuffing our face with donuts, but we just want to be mindful of it. What are some of those herbs we should be incorporating into our everyday lives? Well, it's interesting. You know, what, what I define in the book is the everyday herbs, uh, rhodiola, go-to cola, turmeric. They all have mild anti-diabetic properties, which I found to be really interesting. When I really started digging into the individual herbs, um, yeah, I was finding that they covered all the bases. Um, but there are some that are more specifically recognized for, for helping to uh, control blood sugar levels. Uh, banaba is one, uh, gymnema is one. One that's easily recognized is, is uh, um, uh, cinnamon. Uh, so, so there are a number of different herbs out there. 
And interestingly, uh, we were talking about drugs coming from herbs. Um, the one of the widest uh, selling anti-diabetic drugs, glucophage, uh, metformin is the is the generic name. Actually, came from an herb called goat's root. Um, it's a single chemical that's from that plant, and in that case. This, that, that is a, it's one of the, the, the more uh, uh, outside unique cases. Go through by itself has some toxins in it. So you, it's not an herb that you would want to take regularly, but they pulled this non-toxic chemical out and that became metformin. So we've actually, you know, that drug is actually a step up from the herb. Most of the time it's the other way around. And metformin is making a little bit of a comeback among biohackers um, who are interested in living a uh, very long lives, which I find to be interesting. But to your point, it comes from a plant, it's an herb. Um, so with that said, so you mentioned rhodiola. What are some of, let's spend time on like the everyday herbs, you know, that everyone should have in their cupboard. They just want to feel good or if they're not feeling so great, or they feel good, but they wanna be proactive about their long-term health and well-being and make sure they're, they're set up for success. What are some of those other herbs that everyone should pretty much have in their cupboard and be incorporating into their everyday diet? That's one of the things that I wanted to do with the book is take this thing that seemed so remarkably complex to people. You know, I can remember going to a health food store, you know, 20 years ago and, looking at the shelves and just being totally overwhelmed and not knowing where to start. And the, the answer to that question is there are a lot of great herbs that could be taken every day to protect your health. But what I've tried to do in the book is bring it down to some things that are very available that have been widely studied, that we feel very, very comfortable uh, have a very good safety profile and a low risk of causing adverse reactions and give people a place to start, you know. Um, and these are some of my favorites for various reasons. And I was also looking for herbs that complemented each other, that wasn't, uh, you know, that each herb brought its own little spectrum of benefits to the table. Um, rhodiola, you mentioned, uh, that's a wonderful herb. It is, uh, it, you know, they, they say it's from Siberia. It can be found all along northern regions of the world. But interestingly, they've also found closely related species in the Appalachians of North America. But it tends to grow at higher elevations or harsh uh, cold climates. And very interestingly, when you look at the phytochemistry in er of an herb, the, f the benefits are often reflecting the, in the, the plant's natural environment. So here you've got a plant that grows in a, in, in a harsh environment, and it's really great for protecting us against physical stress factors and just pushing too hard. It's been found to increase oxygenation of heart cells and other cells in the body. It protects the liver, protects the heart, protects the brain. Um, all of these things are immune modulators. They help balance immune system functions. So rhodiola is that really nice herb just for uh, getting you through the day and making you more, a little more resilient. Um, I started taking it uh, years ago. You know, I live at sea level and uh, a few times a year we would go out to Colorado and go skiing. And I would go from sea level and my kids would have me in the, the advanced slope at 11 or 12,000 feet on the first day, which is just an invitation for altitude sickness. And I would load up on rhodiola before I went. And, you know, maybe I wasn't beautiful out there though the first day or two, but I hung in there and I never got altitude sickness. And um, it, so, so it just gives you that resilience. Um, next is reishi mushroom. Um, if you've ever taken a walk in the wood and happened to see a, a, a mushroom that looked kind of like a rainbow, a rust colored rainbow, a shelf mushroom on the side of a tree, that was probably a reishi. There are a lot of, uh, of species of it. 
Um, the species that you finally commonly find in supplements is the Asian variety. It's been well studied in Japan for remarkable anti-cancer effects. And it has been found to have anti antiviral properties. It has activity against COVID. Um, and, uh, and a range of other viruses, uh, good immune modulator. It balances immune systems, just does all kinds of wonderful things for the body, protects the liver. Turmeric, um, people, in tumeric, people in India consume about a gram of turmeric a day in their curries. And that, and so turmeric has been associated with a low rate of Alzheimer's and dementia in, um, in, in India um, because of the phytochemistry protecting cells. So it's, it's really good for reducing inflammation. Um, so it protects joints, protects brain, protects really all the cells in the body. Um, one that's a little less well known is go to cola, also from India. Um, good brain protectant. It's, uh, it was taken in India just to uh, preserve and cognitive functions, and it's calming. Um, has some really wonderful properties, including some really nice anti-diabetic properties. And it's. Um, I found out recently that it naturally grows here in North Carolina and South Carolina which was just fascinating. So you find similar plants or relatives of plants all around the world. Um, milk thistle is one I like. Uh, I think it's really important to take um, that uh, is uh, really important for protecting the liver. And man, in this day and time, our liver just gets bombarded with toxins continually. And I made the observation back when I was doing laparoscopies, uh, surgeries that you look inside someone's abdomen. Um, I always look to the liver. And if you look at a 20-year-old, they had a nice beefy red liver. But somebody by age 40 or 50 started having a mottled yellow liver. And it's where we've burned out fat cells or burned out liver cells and replaced them with fat cells. So as we age, we lose the ability to process toxins, but also manage cholesterol and blood sugar. So it's so loss of liver function is one of the reasons our cholesterol and blood sugars go up. Milk thistle has been found to regenerate liver cells. Um, I've been taking it for about 15 years. Uh, recent cholesterol check, my cholesterol is actually a little better than it was in my early 40s. Um, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And another one that made the list that's kind of an odd, uh, odd bird as far as herbs go is one called shilajit. Um, and this is uh, herbs, plant substances that have been fermented with bacteria in the soil. And it's been uh, recognized for its healing properties in the Himalayas for hundreds of years. Um, you have to, you, you have to find a, a special form that somebody has investigated to make sure that it doesn't have built up toxins or something in it, but it contains fulvic acid and humic acid, which is really good for our GI tract. It's kind of what's missing because a long time ago, back in our foraging days, we used to eat dirt. And when we ate dirt, we ate bacteria and fermented stuff from the soil. We got a lot of fulvic acid and humic acid. We're not getting that in our diet anymore. So this herb, herbal substance called shilajit is a really nice way to replace that. I love it. Fascinating. That's what I haven't heard of. You know, love rhodiola, love turmeric. I take it every day. I love milk thistle. I'll take it every day. So you, you, got, you got some of the staples for me, but that last one that was interesting. Um, so with all that said, in closing, it's clear to me that herbs don't get enough respect, so to speak. And in all of your research, you cite various studies. Was there one study where you said, wow, like why, why aren't more people talking about this, this study over here? Because this is very promising to potentially alter how physicians, practitioners, whether they're Western, Eastern, holistic, what have you, are treating people, and we're not paying attention to this. Was there something that jumped out to you? I think we're all looking for the study that proves the thing that we want to hear. And, and uh, 
what I have to say is I've, you know, this, I couldn't have written this book 10 years ago because the research just wasn't there, but there's just been this explosion of research. So, um, a, a lot of research went into this book and I do kind of cherry pick ones that, that fit particular topics, but there's 70 pages of references um, of all the research that I did. But interestingly, there was one study that was looking at a lot of different herbs, but also some of our food plants and made the conclusion that the phytochemicals coming from these herbs and, and the ones that I just listed were, were on, on this list, on their list, but people who regularly consume these things had a much lower risk of chronic illnesses and cancer. And that's what you want to hear. You know, that's, that's kind of the proof right there. Um, but there's also a lot of data in the book that shows how they do that which I think is just important to recognize. Um, I've tried to pepper it in where I could, but at the same time, keep the book readable um, because if it's, if it's too scientific, then it's just not valuable. So our feedback so far is that people are, are able to enjoy the information too. That's fair, that's fair. Uh, Bill, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Jason.